It's a, it's a real pleasure to have Maram here. You probably recognize on the right side something that goes on in my lab, brain slices going on there. And so he, uh, he was here uh, in 2000, 2010, he finished his PhD at Case Western. Uh, before that, he was Johns Hopkins doing undergrad. And then after leaving my lab in uh, 2000, he went to England and worked with John Jefferies. And John Jefferies is an expert on also brain slices, but very interested in electric fields and how they apply to neural tissue. And that was his interest at the time. And after that, he uh, got a position at City College of New York, the CNY. He's, he's an associate professor now and uh, he's uh, extremely uh, productive. Uh, just looked at the UCV last night, uh, a 20 publication, 2013. Man, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, he's got a lot of grants, and uh, I think part of his success, in my opinion, is, is what I talk to young uh, faculty when they come in, is focus. He focused a lot on this one field which is uh, transcranial uh, DC currents. And this is a new, fairly new field where we're passing very, very small current through the brain. And somehow it's affecting the brain. And somehow nobody knows how it's happening. But I'm sure Maron's going to tell you also about it. And maybe you know how it works. I don't know. We'll try it. We'll try it. We'll try it. So it's a real pleasure to have Maron, please. So I'm thrilled to be here because uh, I got my PhD here, obviously. Um, I think that uh, everything I've done since, since I've been here uh, was a function of what I learned when I was here, really. Uh, when I remember when I was here, you feel like this is the center of the world for neural engineering. And then when you leave, you realize it really, it really is. And so I'm happy to be here. Um, and indeed, it was in, 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 uh, in Dominique's lab where uh, I started as a young grad student to apply direct current stimulation to brain slices. At the time, I don't know if I, I didn't know why I was doing it. Dominique said it was a good idea, so he was the mentor, so we started to do it. Uh, and then it became um, something I became very fascinated about, and then it developed this whole clinical dimension that I'll be talking about today. As Dominique said, this is a very, very simple technique. It's amazingly simple. People describe it as nine volt bal batteries connected to sponges. And the sponges are put in, and in fact, that's what originally it, it was when, when the first people were implementing it. Um, and this is a publication count of completed clinical trials using this technique. This is not ongoing, right? So you can imagine that if that's the case, there must be hundreds of them. And this is the list of the indications that it's being used for. So we've gone from 2000, where there was maybe one paper a year, this year there are a couple sometimes four clinical trials being published every day on this technique. It's nuts, right? And the, and, the, and, the, and the breadth of indications is amazing. So it's depression, it's pain, it's every kind of pain you can think about, it's tinnitus, it's epilepsy, and then uh, driven a lot by the uh, funding from the DOD, there's this notion of using it in healthy people for accelerated learning. And here again, it's for everything. Right? I mean, Dominique used to say everybody and their mother. I know if you still use that expression. Okay, so it's like everything and their mother, right? It's, it's uh, learning, it's mathematical skills, it's, it's, it's threat detection, um, it's everything. And so, and so if you're looking at this at face value, this is really kind of problematic. Because you have something that seems extremely generic and extremely simple. And yet people are claiming that it will work. And if you're, in, you know, if you're in Brazil and you're running a depression trial, it's working for depression. But if you're in, in Boston and you're running a uh, migraine trial, all of a sudden it's working for migraine, right? And if you're in Colombia and you're running a schizophrenia trial, now it's working for schizophrenia. And they're all claiming that it's specific with little side effects. So it's, it's, there's something going on here, right? And so, and, and so Dominique already hinted to this. So from, 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 from my perspective, from the perspective of, I think, how we're, we're trained here, certain questions have to be answered, right? And, and just the most simple way to put it is, one, how can a 9-volt battery do anything? Just even, never mind all these things, how can it do a single thing? Why would passing direct current through your brain 
at all help you with your epilepsy or help you uh, focus on a, a mathematical task, that's a big one. And then once you get past that, how does it do everything that we want it to do? Or maybe it's all some sort of mirage and, and, and a mass hysteria uh, or something like that, right? It's sort of, that's the thing that kind of nags me a bit. Um, so the first thing to keep in mind is that it's not one thing, right? And so even if you're just talking about using just two large electrodes, uh, and one would have to be your anode and one would have to be your cathode, there's an infinite number of variations of where you can put them and what size you make them. So it's not one thing to begin with. And you also have the ability to control your waveform. In the case of transcranial direct current stimulation, you're just limited to the amplitude and the duration. Right? By definition, if you do something else, then it's not no longer transcranial direct current stimulation. And so we can look at the current flow produced by different montages. Um, so this is... Um, um, finite element modeling, the same things that have been pioneered and developed here. And so with TDCS, you always have at least two electrodes as with any electrical stimulation. In the most simple, simple place, you have one anode, one cathode. In this case, you can see it's a model of my head and the anode is on the left and the cathode is on the right. And so my head completes the circuit. And so current's going to flow through the head. It's going to flow in at the anode, flow out at the cathode. Right? This sounds like the neural engineering class here. I hope I'm not getting the convention wrong. Uh, and so we can predict where the current is going to flow through the brain in this case. And it's not particularly surprising. It's generally flowing between the electrodes, right? So the, the brain regions near the electrodes will have a higher electric field or higher current density. And furthermore, we can ask, is the current generally flowing in or out of the brain? So in this case, we're looking at directionality relative to the cortical surface. And again, it's not a shocker that generally under the anode, current is flowing into the head. Cur the brain sees current arriving positive current, and under the cathode, you see current exiting. I'm not going to talk too much about the methodology, but I um, will be showing a lot of slides uh, using this modeling that everyone here is very familiar with. Um, I just really want to emphasize that when we started this project, it was very key to us to preserve resolution. So you're starting with one millimeter in every direction MRI scans, and in the entire modeling workflow, you want to preserve that resolution. It's very easy to take shortcuts uh, that will, will corrupt that. And so, if this plays, well, uh, oops. Anyway, so you can almost tell up there that you have gyri level resolution. And as, and as I'll go through the talk, you'll see why it's really important to have this level of precision. Um, and so then that's what you're seeing here, these current flow models. Now, if we sort of start to zoom in at the cortex, so this is a slightly different montage here. You can see that the cathode has been moved to the supraorbital region. So the current flow across the brain is in a slightly different pattern. And we zoom in, we zoom in on, 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 on a gyri region. The first thing you can see is that the pattern is sort of very clustered. It's not like this even blob. And that's what you might expect if you consider that the cortex is relatively resistive and it's folding and it's encased in the sheet of highly conductive CSF. So inevitably, you get this form of, of clustering uh, that the model predicts. And you'll also, obviously, you'll see that the electric field is not the same everywhere, right? So depending on where you put the electrodes, that will determine the current flow pattern. That's where you'll see intensity. Importantly, though, for what I'm going to be talking about, if we zoom in uh, and then still zoom in further, so let's say to the level of a, of, of a single gyri, and they're projected an image of a neuron on top of it, um, it's important for a lot of the, the um, um, assumptions that I'm going to be showing you, uh, that we consider that the electric field is, even though it varies across the whole head, as far as a single column, it's uniform. Right? So if you're looking at that one neuron and you're looking at the electric field, you can see that if we move down across the column, it is relatively uniform. It's obviously not perfectly uniform, but we're able to show that for the amount that it changes, the polarization of that neuron would be comparable to what a neuron would be uh, polarized if it was exposed to a purely uniform electric field. And so this is something uh, we're calling a quasi-uniform assumption. And so what it does is it allows us to then look at that picture there, which is a picture of the electric field on the surface of the head, and say that represents neuromodulation. That represents regions of influence. Now, th so this is not explicitly modeling neuronal polarization. Now, that is a big step. It's a big, it's a big deviation, right, certainly from from, from what we know is actually important, for example, to consider cellular morphology. 
Now, we make this assumption uh, based on this, on, this, on this notion of uniform electric field. We also make it because we have no choice. So if you really wanted to consider cell activation and model it at the cellular level across the whole head, you're now talking about trillions of neurons with millions of morphologies and conductivity and so on. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an assumption we try to justify. It's also an assumption we just sort of make because we have no choice. Um, there are reasons why it might actually be rational. And one of them is to think of sort of the, the cortex as a big spaghetti. And so if you have many, many neurons at all possible orientations, right, um, it may be a right to think of this as a soup. And so it may be reasonable to think of maximum polarization at that region as tracking electric field. And, uh, and I'll come back to that notion, uh, but a lot of what I'll be showing you is predicated on the fact that we can look at these images of electric field and consider them meaningful. Um, and so what I'm showing you here, when I'm showing you current flow or also direction current flow, this is just electric field. And so I'm assuming that regions of electric field will be more influenced. Regions with less electric field will be less influenced, not modeling uh, explicitly neuronal polarization. Um, um, breaking down this notion of inward and outward further, um, we can imagine now that this is a cortical pyramidal neuron, so like a layer five, six neuron, and you have this asymmetrical structure with this big apical dendrite pointed out toward the surface. And in a very cartoonish way, if you imagine that the ando is on the surface, so we have current now flowing into the brain, this will produce a general polarization profile that looks like this. So this is a direct sustained current, so it produces a direct sustained polarization, and so the compartments that are near the anode will be hyperpolarized generally, the compartments that are away from the anode will be depolarized, and so we have this biphasic polarization, but if you assume that the soma is what matters, and this is just an assumption, if you assume the soma is what matters, you'll say this is not net zero, and this is actually an increase in excitability, some sort of generic increase in function, and that's a big hand-waving statement. And if you think about the cathode, it's the opposite, so the current is flowing the opposite way. The polarization profile of these particular neurons is flipped. Uh, and so we get a somatic hyperpolarization. And then in a very big hand-waving way, people will say, well, this is going to be a decrease in function of this brain region. I'm certainly going to talk about those assumptions in more detail. As far as actually looking if this sort of bimodal polarization is true, uh, certainly we expect it to be true. Uh, we've used different techniques. Uh, for example, uh, this is optical imaging with voltage-sensitive dyes. Uh, this is just a multi-compartment uh, model that uh, Cameron ran uh, maybe almost 10 years ago now. And generally speaking, you see a general polarization profile that's consistent with this sort of bimodal polarization. Certainly a little bit more subtle, uh, but you can see that you have this sort of um, uh, almost like a linear shift in polarization going from one end to the other, going from hyperpolarized to depolarized. So the compartments in the middle are not polarized at all. And the reason the somas are polarized is because they're not in the middle. So by virtue of not being not in the middle, they're somewhat polarized. Now there's a couple interesting things uh, about this. Uh, first of all, you're looking, we're looking across all neurons. We tend to see this bimodal polarization, but it's also very linear. It's actually striking linear. Like if you look at these different compartments here, right, you can almost like draw a line. And so it almost looks like it's actually tracking the extracellular voltage, right, which is sort of very anti-ethical, right, to, to, what we, to what we know really matters, right. That's how you fail your neural engineering qualifier is by saying that extracellular voltage determines polarization. But when we're running these models, we're applying uh, cortical neurons to uniform electric fields. Again and again, we see these kind of profiles. So we, we look at different morphologies. And again and again, it just look, looks like it's the extracellular voltage. It looks like the polarization that any compartment is experiencing just depends on which isopotential line it happens to lie in. And it seems that it's rather morphology independent, meaning if it's that shape or that shape. Right? And it also seems that it's largely membrane properties dependent. So I'll come back to this, but I'm flagging this up because I know this is a very unusual thing to say. Um, and there are, of course, exceptions. For example, there are incoming afferent axons coming into this region, right? And they will terminate, and they will polarize more with sort of the classic E lambda, uh, the way a terminal will polarize. So, but as far as the actual cells themselves, and these are rather compact cells, we always see this kind of polarization. We can ask also how much to do that. We did intracellular recording. Uh, this is all in rat brain slice, and we're able to also morphologically reconstruct these cells. So this is this layer uh, five cell in rat, I think this is motor cortex, 
Uh, there's a layer two, three cell, and there's also an interneuron. We can apply a direct current using that picture that I showed you in the beginning. That's the methodology I learned in, in Dominique's labs. So you're applying a direct current across these cells. We're recording intracellularly from the soma, and we're able to see how much they polarize. And so there's an assumption that the amount of polarization you get is linearly related with the electric field strength. So I can summarize that just by saying that you have so much polarization per unit electric field. So in this case, this cell polarized 0.3 millivolt per one millivolt of electric field. So you know, two volts per meter, 0.6 millivolts. If you reverse the direction, the polarization happens in the other direction. So we've done this from dozens of cells, and for each cell you can, get a, 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 you can quantify how much that cell polarizes. It is pretty linear for these low intensity fields, and the most sensitive cells are polarizing about 0.3 millivolts. And again, this is not shocking to anybody in this room, right? Because if you're looking at an interneuron and it has this sort of morphology and the soma just happens to be sort of in the middle, right? Then it's not going to be preferentially polarized one way or the other. Now, that's not saying the dendrites are not polarized, just because of where the soma sits. Um, and also larger cells. Morphology does matter as far as size, right? So larger cells will polarize more. So 0.3 millivolts per volt per meter. Now, if we take a step back and combine the finite element modeling with this analysis, we get something a bit surprising. So during TDCS, maximum current applied is about 2 milliamp. And this is largely uh, driven by tolerability. The maximum electric field you'll see, and by the maximum, I mean that tiny little hot spot somewhere, right, is 0.4 volts per meter. It's typically less than that. The most sensitive cell, and I mean the most sensitive cell out of 100 cells, is going to polarize at the soma. Uh, oh, this should be 0.4 millivolt per volt, vo volt per meter. Oh, sorry, 0 0.3 polarization per volt per meter. And so you see, um, you know, you can, you can jiggle these numbers around a little bit, but you're talking about less than a millivolt of polarization, right? And likely something more like 0.1 millivolt of polarization at the soma. This is not much. It's certainly not much in the central nervous system where you have cells that are constantly activated. They're constantly shifting around from rest, which is, could be around minus 80. They're firing at minus 60. There's EPSPs. There's, this is even below what people would consider noise level. And so there's a bit of a question mark about why such a tiny polarization would do anything uh, as far as changing brain function, right? This notion of why DC currents would do anything. Yeah. What other numbers are that uh, it's a, off the top of my head, it's, it's, it's about a millivolt. So it's not, it's not, it's more, yeah. but I would say it's still a, a small amount. Um, but of course, what is small, right? That's, that's sort of the question. Uh, and so um, just to sort of uh, get a perspective on it, typically when you're talking about super threshold stimulation, uh, activating a nerve and you're applying a pulse, or in the, in the central nervous system, you're applying transcranial magnetic stimulation, you're activating the structure, right? And so people will call this super threshold stimulation, but I'm calling it here actually specifically high intensity. And so you're driving a network. Now, low intensity DC stimulation, if you apply that, let's say, in a dish to a quiescent group of cells, they will not fire action potentials, right? You're only polarizing them about a millivolt. All right, so people will then also refer to this as sub-threshold stimulation. But the basic principle is that the brain is highly active, right? And so in this situation, when you're applying a low-intensity electric field, you may then change the pattern of activity, right? That's the cartoon version of this that I, I'd like to get into uh, more specifically. So this is one uh, uh, study we did to look at this issue. It's possible in a, in a brain slice, in a dish, to induce something that looks like gamma. So uh, gamma is considered very important in humans. In, in, a, in a brain slice, you can induce an oscillation that's roughly at the same frequency. That's pr pretty much probably where the similarity ends. But this is sort of a coherent emergent network property that you can pick up in the field. And so this is an ongoing oscillation. oscillation. And we've also developed um, uh, network models of this. So what I'm showing you here is the response of that activity to a direct current stimulation. And so this is a spectrogram, and you can see here the power. It's, it's, it's slightly lower. Uh, what gamma is in a rat is slightly lower than what gamma would be in a person. Uh, but you have an oscillation going on here. And then at this time point here, a field is turned on. 
So in the case of anode, and by anode I'm, I mean a soma depolarizing field, you can see that as soon as we turn that field on, you get a very robust response. And this is not just an artifact. If you record intracellularly, you'll see a huge spiking of the cells. So it's not just an artifact of the signal processing. So you get this huge response. And if you, and during the, as long as the field is turned on, you have a significant but small increase in the power relative to the baseline situation. And then we turn it off. And with the cathodal stimulation, this is the soma hyperpolarizing stimulation, you see that there's more of this tonic suppression. But what's also pretty obvious is that there's this adaptation going on. So right here, after that initial very robust response, it's almost like the system made a correction. Right? It's almost like somehow the system made a correction, and it's really obvious when you look at the end. So after we turn off the field, so that blue period, the field is actually off. Right? So we've gone back to no field period, but you can see that the activity is actually gone. Right? The oscillations are gone at least for a short period of time. So this, in this period of time here, there is no field. So all things being equal, you'd expect to go back to the original oscillation, but you don't right away. And that is consistent and something that we can, we can break down at the level of the network model with the system adapting. And you see the exact opposite thing with cathodal. So initially, you actually see a very cathodal, meaning soma hyperpolarizing. You see initially a very strong suppression. But then somehow the activity comes back. And now when we turn it off, this is post-stimulation, right? There's this huge rebound effect as the field is removed. We're, not, we're never exciting here, not strictly, right? We're simply now removing inhibition, and we're seeing this response. And, and, um, um, and a couple things you know, uh, are striking to me when we start to think about this. When you're actually recording intracellularly, and you're looking at these cells, yes? It's a great point. So we, what, we, I don't have, uh, I don't even have the data here, but we've actually sweeped sinusoids across these slices. We've also had rectified sinusoids, so monophanic sinusoids, and so we can characterize the way the system not just responds to DC fields, but to a wide variety of waveforms. Um, and in the case of AC fields, you actually see a very ro robust response. We actually see something even more robust than this. And the reason is you sort of hyperpolarize the system. It effectively starts to adapt by increasing its excitability. Now this excitatory phase of the sinusoid comes by, and you see this huge overshoot. And so you actually get a, a sort of a, an amp. If you apply, let's say, a 1 hertz here, you'll see an amplitude modulation of the gamma that's very robust. Um, and yes, and I know I'm glossing over a lot of the methods here. This is an extracellular recording of the field. This is, an, and again, I'm sorry, I'm really glossing over it. This is hippocampus. This is the CA3 region of the hippocampus. And again, this is for us, this is just a model system. This is just a system that happens to be oscillating. You know what I mean? And we're not, we're not interpreting it as anything more than that as far as its, its, its functional relevance. Um, and so a couple important things. One is these cells, as I mentioned before, are all essentially at threshold. If you, if you record intracellularly, and let's say firing threshold is at uh, minus 65, they're at minus 66, right? And they are constantly moving, this oscillation is moving them th up into threshold and down into threshold. The system is in fact finely tuned to bring the neurons up to exactly that level. And so you get a very fine balance of excitation and inhibition. The system is designed to maintain neurons at this level. They want them ready to go and they want these neurons firing somewhat regularly. So if you are basically almost at threshold, in fact, you may be on your way to firing. Now, a very small depolarization will obviously push you over the edge. And so this is not all the cells, but at any given point, you're going to have some cells of these tens of thousands of cells, right, that are right near threshold. They're probably going to fire anyways, even without the field, right? They're on their way, because that's how the system is designed. And now you apply a little bit of excitatory stimulus, and those guys fire. And they're actually part of this larger network. And now the whole network starts to go. And so the fact that you have this active system, this notion of what is sub and what is super threshold stimulation starts to be a bit blurry because clearly the low intensity stimulation can trigger a lot of firing. And, and the, the, it's, it's the state of the system. It's, it's the system itself that has made itself so susceptible. 
The other thing is, and this is obvious, but it's, it's important to say, is that you can see that the direct current can produce more or less gamma. Now, it doesn't mean that direct current stimulation can generate gamma oscillations. That's very complicated. That's a very complicated property of the system, and it's a dynamical property. But we can apply a very, very simple signal into the system and modulate this very complicated phenomenon. And so, and I'll come back to these questions. When we talk about how can such a simple intervention modulate brain function, uh, well, we can think that if the system is extremely complicated, and if you intervene with it in the right way, you can produce rather subtle and complex changes. Right? So if now I'm applying direct current to someone and they're learning math faster, maybe it's not because right, the direct current somehow gave the brain more direct current, right? and that makes you learn math faster. Maybe it's because the direct current enhanced gamma power, and gamma power is now a substrate for learning. It's still a bit hand wavy. And important, yeah? In your path, um, you don't have any blocker or anything is completely spontaneous. So, so to, do, spontaneous to make slice oscillate, you have to, we're in this case, it's, it's a model called, it's, we're adding carbacol. It's, it's an agent, so there's different ways to make, slices normally are very, very quiet. Uh, and in fact, um, yeah, they're dead quiet. So we need to add something to drive them. To, but when we do that, we're actually making them behave more like the real brain. So the real brain is more like this. Not, no neurons in our brain right now are quiet. They're all extremely active. So this is more like the real brain. Yes, yes, and there's, there's kinate, you can raise potassium. Yes, yes, yes. Um, um. And so the other key piece when we talk about specificity that I want to introduce now is that when TDCS is applied as a therapy, it's never really applied as sort of a monotherapy. It's always applied with something. So for example, if you suffer a stroke and you're getting uh, motor rehabilitation, particularly of the, where the function is lost, the direct current is applied adjunct to that therapy. Right? So you're trying to recover some sort of function right, with a physical therapist, with a robot, and they're applying direct current at the same time. And the goal is to make you learn, get more out of that rehabilitation. No one assumes that if you just sit there and get direct current, you're going to get better at this. And also, no one assumes that if you're training this left arm, the right arm will get better. What they're assuming is that you can apply direct current in response to something else that is driving the system. And together, you will get chief specificity. And so that's what I wanted to talk about next. Um, before I get there, so the, the picture might be something like this. We may have an, an anode electrode producing a dominantly inward current that's producing a soma depolarizing. And that's somehow enhancing some sort of ongoing activity in, in a very broad sense. That is going to be combined now with some sort of subject-specific training, some, some task that activates a very, very specific network inside the brain, a very specific series of synapses. And together, maybe, this now provides a cellular substrate for how you might enhance learning. Let's just say hypothetically that when you have more gamma, you're able to undergo long-term potentiation better, and that's somehow substrate for learning. Now, this would be task-specific, because only what is trained at the same time would be done. Um, and it's compelling because it, it starts to introduce TDCS as a general tool for neuroplasticity. So when you're trying to change the, when you're trying to change the brain, when the brain is broken and you're trying to change it, whether it's epilepsy or autism, you may generally say that you're trying to promote neuroplasticity, right? You're trying to make the brain not the way it was before by definition, right? You're trying to train the brain to do something that it could not do before. In that sense, in that very global sense, if direct current helps those processes happen, Maybe it is something that could be deployed uh, for a variety of range of things. So that, again, coming back to those questions that uh, I'm not going to answer, but I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to bring this into the, into the realm of plausibility, right? That this might actually be possible. We can drill down to this very precisely at the level of the brain slice. And so we can talk about direct current plus uh, ongoing activity. So at the level of a brain slice, we can, we can micro, we use microstimulation of a specific afferent synaptic pathway onto a particular structure, and can, we can record the response to that structure. So this will look like this. This is a field EPSP. And the size of this is a measure. This is, these cells are not, by the way, firing. This is not strong enough to make the postsynaptic cells fire. But it is obviously strong enough to make the axons fire, release neurotransmitter. That is picked up. And the efficacy of that postsynaptic potential is reflected in the size uh, of this. And this is the stimulus artifact from the 
orthodromic stimulation. And we can apply direct current as we do this. If we apply a direct current that is soma depolarizing, we find that the size of this response increases. That means that for the same input coming in, we see a stronger postsynaptic response. And if we apply a field that is hyperpolarizing at the soma, but this would actually be depolarizing at the dendrite, we see that the response actually gets smaller. We can probe a variety of different pathways, and we, f we found actually that regardless of where the pathways were coming in, the direction of response was predicted based on the direction of the soma polarization. So even for a pathway coming in on the apical dendrite, a soma depolarizing field would enhance it. And so very generally, oh, and this, by the way, the stronger the field, the stronger the modulation. So you might almost think of this, if this is an, an anodal stimulation, if this is a cathodal stimulation, you might think of the field, right, as changing synaptic efficacy. And if, if I just modify this experiment a little bit, but it's the exact same idea, now we're applying a train. So here you have a train of input coming in. This is still not exactly physiological, right? But you have a train of inputs coming in. So we're basically doing orthodromic, 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 orthodromic. And each one produces an EPSP. And there's actually some, some adaptation. There's some gain adaptation that you can see right in the beginning. During this train of ongoing afferent activity, so there's a volley of synapse, a volley of synapse, a volley of synapse, we apply the, the slice version, right, of a nodal stimulation. So this would be soma depolarizing. You can see that during this whole time, the EPSPs get bigger. Right? They're all bigger, which means that the cell is able to sustain a higher level of input. Um, and we can, we can quantify it and look at it in different ways. But the, the, uh, the high level point of why this makes us excited uh, is that people who study long-term potentiation and long-term depression as well, but specifically long-term potentiation in animal models, know that the ability to sustain a higher level of input is a great substrate for long-term potentiation. This is what leads to long-term potentiation. Any perturbation that increases the ability of the cell to sustain a higher level of incoming input, that's great for long-term potentiation. So if a direct current can do this, a direct current may make it easier to undergo plasticity. Now, the direct current is not producing the plasticity. If I apply the direct current on its own, nothing's going to happen. But if the input is now coming in, and this input might be capable of inducing plasticity or might be able to induce a weak plasticity, we now apply the direct current with it, that input is now more efficacious and it might become something that might be more effective. And the reason this is compelling is this would be specific. So this is what we're probing now as well. So let's say you have multiple pathways coming in, right? You tetanize this pathway specifically. This becomes active. You're learning something, let's say. And now we apply the DC field, and we're able to promote plasticity just here and not in the other pathways, right? And so this notion how, that when you co-activate, it's sort of habian, right? When you co-activate things, the direct current is promoting plasticity in only the pathway that you want. And in this sense, it's almost good that direct current is subthreshold. You almost want it to be this sort of true modulator. Um, so I want to change gears just a, a, a little bit uh, and talk about um, um, some technology that we developed that we're calling um, high definition uh, TDCS. And all that simply means is that we're replacing the large pads, sponge saline filled sponges that are conventionally used with small electrodes. And so these are gel filled electrodes. Uh, and this is something that we started to consider about five years ago. It seemed to us that if you wanted to stimulate a small part of the brain, let's say a part of the brain that's this big, it may not make sense to put a pad that is, you know, this big on the head and another pad here. And yet, when we started this work about six years ago, you would read in the literature that someone would put a pad this big here, another pad this big here, and they will say that that is M1 stimulation. Right? The clinicians were comfortable at that point saying that, I mean, it was amazing because the target was even smaller right, than the size of the pad. But that was the thinking. There was, there, they sort of came to that conclusion. If it was prefrontal and so on. It obviously does not work that way. If you have two large pads, you're going to be very limited right, and how focal you could be. So it seemed reasonable to say, well, why don't we use smaller electrodes? And by virtue of using smaller electrodes, you can use more electrodes, right? Because now you can put them closer to one another. And that's all we meant by high definition. It's, it's to distinguish itself from conventional TDCS, which uses sponge pads. And so the current at each electrode can now be controlled, right? And it, it's going to be very obvious to everyone in this room. And by doing that, you can consider how you might optimize this for targeting 
Uh, what's nice also about this, so this has now been, these systems have now been built. This remains a non-invasive system, but it's highly flexible, right, because you can have a single system, but you can energize these electrodes in a very wide uh, uh, um, sort of configurations. It's, it's uh, low cost, as I'll show you later. It's, it's very well tolerated. Um, we did have to spend a couple of years working on the electrodes themselves. Um, this is more of a, um, uh, a rendering. Oh, the movies aren't playing. But this is more of a rendering of the electrodes. It took us a while. So uh, everyone knows direct current is the worst thing you could ever do to an electrode, right? If you want to break an electrode, I think direct current is a really great way uh, to degrade an electrode. If you want to create electrochemical reactions, that's how you would, that's the best way to do it, right? To, and especially if you, and not only that, if you want to drive it in one direction, right? Don't reverse, don't reverse charge. And so we had this problem. The way we overcame this is we simply basically went to the point where we said, you know what? Let's be comfortable with failure. As long as the failure doesn't lead to any irritation during the course of stimulation. And so the electrodes are disposable. And, we're, and if you're thinking about the electrochemical products as being formed largely at the, at the electrode here gel interface, we brought that up. We moved it away from the skin to create more of a gel buffer. And as long as all that stuff, whatever is being created, is restricted here and does not diffuse to the skin, Right? We believe, and we've tested this, that this can lead to very tolerable stimulation. So you're not just thinking about how, how the, you're not just thinking about current density at this interface, right? You're actually also thinking about diffusion. And so this, this elevation and ended up being a little bit bulky in the vertical direction ended up being very critical. Doing this, making a lot of mistakes, refining this empirically, we were eventually able to come up with electrodes that could pass two milliamp for 20 minutes, and that was really the target. There was no, at this point, there's no rationale to go. Do you have to throw them out afterward? Sure, but you can do that, right? Just don't take the gel, throw it away. Maybe you have to you throw out the electrode, or maybe you can reuse it. So I can, I can talk more about the materials that we used, uh, but that was the general principle. We also then said, well, with so many degrees of freedom, right, if you have 64 electrodes, 32 electrodes, and each electrode can have any current from minus two milliamp to two milliamp. It presents many, many degrees of freedom, right? And not only that, you can almost arbitrarily deploy these electrodes across the head in any array you want. So how do you go about optimizing that? Um, uh, I collaborate closely, Yasek and, and Lucas Parr, who's also faculty at City College, realize that this is actually, there's, there's a closed form solution to this. Now this derives from the fact that we think that electric field is the only thing that mattered. So if you think that electric field is the only thing that matters, and this is an assumption, but I told you it's good, it is important, then if I take, for example, a current here and I solve that for one milliamp, and I get an electric field distribution in the head, I don't need to resolve that for two milliamp. I know that for two milliamp, the electric field will just be double everywhere, right? Now if I take an electrode here, I do need to resolve it because the head is not a perfect sphere. So I take another electrode, I need to solve for the electric field there. Let's say I do that for one milliamp. Now, I don't need to resolve for minus one milliamp. I can simply invert it. So if you take all the electrodes and you deploy them and you solve just once, right, for any current, it doesn't matter. Now, right, just by linear algebra, you can predict, right, what the electric field will be for any combination. And moreover, using things like, you know, least squares and all that, if you pick a target, you can, you can try to find the best current that, that will produce the solution that you mo most want. And this now has actually been programmed. This is a, this is a laptop. This is a GUI-driven laptop. Um, so whatever I'm doing now on, on supercomputers, this can do extremely quickly, instantly. Not just solve the electric field, but give you the best solution. Turned out this was only the beginning. This sort of, this, I think this was a good technical achievement, but it was only sort of the beginning of the problem. Because now you have to ask, well, what's the best? Right? OK, so if you want an electric field somewhere, I can give you the best, but there's so many questions that come up. For example, what is your region of interest? So if you want to, if you're interested in PTSD, what is your region of interest? And moreover, you know, it's impossible to generate a little glowing dot in the brain, right? Current has to get there somewhat. So you have to start thinking about there's collateral brain regions. Maybe there's other brain regions that you're interested in stimulating, other regions you want to avoid. And, and if you optimize for focality or intensity, you get very different solutions. So intensity is usually like this. Right, just go right through. If you don't care, just, pack, just get everything, right? Increase, increase the current as much as you want and just blast the whole thing. Focality is much more challenging. And even more subtle is the direction. So you can optimize just for electric field magnitude, but if direction matters, right? So this will be an anode here and a cathode here, but this will be totally different. It's gonna be roughly an anode here and a cathode here. 
And it, it, it gets very hard sometimes. If, so maybe elect direction doesn't matter, but if direction does matter, it's really hard to guess that. And then there's also safety concerns. I already mentioned the maximum current per electrode. You can maximize for that. Uh, you can optimize also for, you can constrain for total current. Also, you can constrain for, let's say, maximum current density in the brain. So if you're concerned about something hazardous happening, all that is actually very tractable mathematically. That's currently not the hard part. The hard part is what is it that you want, right? What is it that you want and that you can achieve using the amount of electrodes that you have? One montage that we've been um, uh, investigating perhaps the most in clinical trials is the 4X1. And that just means that there is uh, one, let's say, anode surrounded by four cathodes or one cathode surrounded by the four anodes. And so obviously the current's going to be the same everywhere. So if you have one milliamp through the center anode, you'll have negative 0.25 through all the cathodes. And the basic idea is that the current will go in and it'll be collected by the ones on the outside. And again, for everyone in this room, this seems like a pretty obvious step forward. Um, uh, but it certainly was not uh, for the TDCS community at the time. This is the prediction of the current flow patterns in the head. And there's a few things that we, we, we like about this. One of them is that it seems that it's largely unidirectional. So when you use two electrodes, you know, you always, whatever flows in obviously has to flow out. And you tend to have a region of both inward and outward current flow. That may be good, but maybe you don't want that. What's happening here is still all the current that, let's say, flows in has to flow out, but it's flowing in over one particular region and it's flowing out over a much wider region, right? And so the maximum electric fields in the return directions are much lower. So in that sense, it's unidirectional, right? If you're assuming that you need, let's say, a certain threshold of electric field for this to be meaningful. So by setting the po polarity of the center electrode, you can get a dominantly inward or a dominantly outward current flow. Again, this is all on this quasi-uniform assumption. I'm always assuming that this electric field that I'm representing is meaningful for neuromodulation. Another thing that we sort of struggled with was people always said that the skull resistivity put an upper limit on how focal you can be with transcranial stimulation, electrical, right? I think that's why people use large sponges to begin with, because they just thought you cannot be focal if you go through the head. And it's also why a lot of effort has been put into transcranial magnetic stimulation, right? The skull is transparent to magnetic fields, but it's highly resistive to electric current. So when we did this, we started to constrain the ring more and more and more. And we found that you could be more and more and more and more focal. Now you lose more current to the scalp, right? And so there's a limit there in how much current, but theoretically you can constrain and constrain and constrain. And we thought, well, what does it mean about the skull? And what we realized when we actually looked at the skull is, ironically, it's the one place where current does not diffuse. It's really radial through the skull because it's really resistive. Right? So you have issues about having a skull CSF boundary, and you have a skull skin boundary, and that difference in resistivity is meaningful and needs to be constrained. But it's not, it's not simply that just having a very, something, necessarily having something very resistive means that you cannot be focal. Uh, and what's happening here is simply that, again, the current that's moving, the, the, the ring is simply collecting the current as it flows out. There's really no reason why current will, let's say, flow here into the brain, you know, right? It just, it, the physics don't really add up. And so this was this 4X1 montage. It's very simple. You can move it across the head, right? I, can, I mean, if I did this montage on this table, the current would still be constrained within the ring. Right? So it's very robust. You can move it across the head. It's also very superficial. The tighter you make the ring, the more superficial it is. So it's a nice montage if you want to target the cortex. It's not good if you want to target deep brain structures, but it turns out there's enough to target in the cortex, right? There's enough targets there for many diseases. I'm not going to go in. Yeah. Yes. I just want to make sure that I'm following this. If the, the, the gradient that you see is 0.4, you were telling, if I got it right, at one volt per meter, you were seeing 0.3 millivolts. 0.3 millivolts. So you're down pretty small the, uh, the what you would expect this yeah. potential to be. So I, I have it right. Yeah, so this, you're talking about a polarization here that would be 0.1 millivolt at the soma, maybe 0.5 millivolt at the dendrite. It's so tiny that you almost want to say it's not going to make a difference, right? Okay, <laughs> it's so tiny, and if and if and also if you're you know if you're paying close attention, the, the let's say the result I showed you with the uh, gamma oscillations that was not for 0.4 uh, volt per meter, that was for six volt per meter. Yeah. And with in this context of this, you 
somebody's measured some phenomena, a phenomena. Yes. That's changed. In humans. So this is something that, act, that is actually providing some value that you can measure. So, yes. And so the, the one of the key validations that was done, and this was this, this um, it was actually a phase one trial um, that was run by Germany, is, is they use transcranial magnetic stimulation. And so they put that over the motor region and they're able to listen an MEP. So they do that in subjects and they get a baseline MEP. After they get that, they go in and they apply the, either conventional TDCS or they can apply 4X1 TDCS. And what they find is that when they apply this 4X1 with the anode in the center, this MEP goes up approximately 20% for a two milliamp of stimulation for 10 minutes. This is actually post-stimulation, so this is a lasting effect. And when they do cathodal, they see something in the other way. The, that that blow-up, that chart I showed where things went nuts, 2000 was when they demonstrated that direct current could affect TMS MEPs. And it's sort of, then it's sort of that was the experiment. This neuro, it was a purely neurophysiological experiment where they showed that application of weak direct current could reproducibly change the, the responsiveness of the brain to TMS. I think that was very meaningful because it sort of showed people that there may actually be some real substrate here. Since then, it's been tried for every possible indication, and you may argue that's a bit of a that's that's a, maybe a bit of a stretch, uh, but that result itself has been replicated. Um, but it is something that we struggle with because, in my lab, at the level of the the slice, it is very hard to resolve effects at 0.4 volt per meter. In fact, almost you'll, you'll see that in almost none of our papers we do. Can we do it? Sure. If you do enough repetitions and enough statistics, right, you just keep applying the field over and over and over again, you do 10,000 repetitions in a brain slice, you can resolve a statistically significant effect. But these are really, really tiny. And so one area that is, is very uh, important for us and other people doing the animal work on this is to try to demonstrate a good size effect with a really tiny field, right? And so I've been pointing to it that there, there may be substrates for amplification, but we still need to move in that direction. One clue, though, what we have is that stimulation to work has to be applied for several minutes. So one of the things that they found in 2000 was that if you do just one second of stimulation, you may get an effect during, but as soon as you turn it off, there is no change in TMS afterward. They had to go to several minutes of stimulation in order to see an effect afterward. So that means that there's something cumulative going on. Right? And so all the experiments that, that I've done so far in my lab where we only applied stimulation for a few seconds may be missing that cumulative effect. They may be missing something that is sort of ongoing. And it turns out if you go back to the 60s, there were people applying direct current to, to animals back then. I don't know, I think they were just doing it because I think if you're going to apply something, direct current might be the simplest thing, right? Sort of a monophasic pulse, you just hook up a battery. So I don't know if they had a translational reason to do it. They were just curious what would happen. And there's plenty of evidence from that literature. This is even 50s, showing that when you apply direct current and when you leave it for a while and then you turn it off, you see a sustained change in excitability and there's many molecular changes associated with it. This was still, though, rather big fields. This was usually on the exposed cortex, people like Purpura. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the British were doing this. Um, and so we certainly don't know everything about it, but we've gone ahead and we're supporting uh, various clinical trials. There's many clinical trials on TDCS and others on high definition. This is just the ones using 4X1. Uh, uh, some have been completed, uh, some have ongoing. It's certainly been a learning experience about how to, to facilitate that translation. Um, um, but there's still obviously many questions. So I just want to show you this. Oh, maybe it won't work. Hmm. Um, I don't want to exit because it's being recorded. What's well, the last slide? So let me see if I can, if I can do it here. This is a rendering of this of this uh, of a protocol that we're running. Let's see if it plays. Hmm. All right. Never mind. Let me explain. So this is particularly the, this Harvard fibromyalgia trial, and I wanted to specifically highlight it because it kind of tries to bring together some of these cellular level understandings that we have. So this is pain. So it's not like with rehab where it seems kind of obvious, right? You want to do TDCS with rehab, do the rehab, right, and apply that with TDCS. But what does that mean for depression? What does that mean for pain? So in this particular protocol, what we're doing is we're actually applying painful stimuli to the forearm, right? There's this company called Medoc and they make these sort of heat coils, and you can apply a painful stimuli, 
and you can actually put an EEG cap on someone, and you can record an event-related potential related to that. And it turns out that people with pain have different forms of event-related potential. In this trial, we're applying stimulation in conjunction with these painful stimuli. We're trying to apply direct current stimulation, and we're actually trying to pair it with something, in this case, something noxious. We're trying to activate those networks. We're actually trying to make that person right, experience pain right, at the same time as we're applying something that we hope can produce plasticity in those same networks. So that idea, um, well, let me come back to that idea. Just a couple last slides. I think, uh, um, just taking a step back, thinking about TDCS in the context of other neuromodulation modalities, there's always going to be a trade-off between the complexity and the invasiveness of the technique, um, which you're pushing in order to get more focality. So in the case of deep brain stimulation, the reason why you're drilling a hole in someone's skull and pushing an electrode is because you want to be focal. Otherwise, you could just do ECT, right? You can go across the whole head. So that's the whole thing. And same thing with, with anything that's subcranial. Transcranial magnetic stimulation was also the innovations there, the figure of eight, right, coil, was all about trying to be focal. And that's why people got excited about it as opposed to, let's say, putting you know, a, a, a coil around the entire head. And for a long time, transcranial direct current stimulation was considered very promising because it's so cheap, so well tolerated, so simple to apply, right? But it was not focal. But with the use, simply by using arrays, you, you can approach that. And I also want to point out that when you're talking about super threshold stimulation, you can't just stimulate the target, right? You stimulate everything that that target then activates. You stimulate everything that synapses to the target. I mean, this is, this is, these were ideas that were developed here, right? You stimulate everything that passes in between. And so when you talk about super threshold stimulation, I'm going back to that word, right? You, you know, when you talk about what you're stimulating, it's a little bit different. Now, when you're talking about low intensity stimulation, it may be more correct to say that really where the current is restricted, right? is where you're going to see your primary action of neuromodulation, though, of course, the, the brain is entirely connected. And so the final thing is this notion of functional targeting. So this is one, one last slide. So let's say I put the electrode here on the top of the head, and I generate an um, electric field in the head. And they're simply, and these, these are my targets. And there's just no way I can separate them out. They're literally physically interspersed. So I cannot modulate one without modulating the other as far as electrical stimulation. But I now do something that causes these particular guys to activate. I want you to think about how you're sad. I'm going to cause you pain. Let's do some rehabilitation. I want you to work on this math problem. You do something that specifically activates them. And so the notion is obvious in a sense, right? That now if, if the electric field specifically works on this network because it's activated, not the other ones, we can actually achieve a specificity that is even beyond what you can achieve spatially. Right? So this is, might be called a form of functional specificity. And it just happens to be that this is how TDCS is almost always done. I don't know how they came to this, right? but all these clinical trials I'm showing you with transcranial direct current stimulation almost always pair it with something. And they always ask the question, is the thing that we paired it with, and they're, by the way, often using big pads, but they always ask the question, is the thing that we paired it with boosted? And as controls, they ask, are things that we did not pair it with not modulated? Right? That's the general idea. So, so um, I don't have those two questions, right? I mean, but I remember, and I think Dominique asked me this question, I don't know, five years ago when we were, this transcranial direct current stimulation first came up. How could this possibly be doing anything? And how could it possibly be specific? I know I've not answered those questions, but what I've tried to do is kind of show you that maybe it's not all crazy, and, 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 and maybe with, with further engineering, these issues can actually be broken down to the point where this is actually approached in a much more rational way. That was my, thank you for your attention. That was. So we have time for a few questions. Yeah, Dominique. Explain more about yeah, what you said concerning, there is, it seemed like there is a direct effect. So you turn on the, Right, there's a lasting effect, that's right. There's a lasting effect. So supposedly the, the, the direct effect is due to polarization, and later the after effect is due to probably to synaptic plasticity. So does that, 
match with what we know about LTP because it's known that if you inject a DC current in an infant cell directly, you can induce LTP if paired a synaptic Paired input, right? That's a long that's been known for a long time. I don't know if these currents there are similar to what we would expect to see, and if the duration of the potentiation is similar to the LTP. So can you explain the after effect button LTP? The short answer is no, but I can. I mean, but what you're saying is right. So, if, first of all, you take a cell in isolation, and you apply all the direct current to it that you want. I think when you turn off that direct current, you will not see any plasticity. So, I don't think you see much at the membrane level. But when there's an input coming in, it's very well known that the polarization state of the of that postsynaptic neuron will really determine how much plasticity you get. So, when when an input comes in, it really likes it when when that postsynaptic structure is depolarized. Some, that's in fact why sometimes you send in barrages of inputs. The first ones depolarize it, the second ones facilitate it. And so there's, there's a lot of work on that. There's NMDA receptors that are unblocked and so on. And so you could think that the direct current is producing a depolarization, right? And that is now facilitating this. this. But the thing is, it's still a very small amount of depolarization. It's still a millivolt. So if you look at these studies, they'll say, well, that's not going to be enough. And so what may, all, what may actually be happening is that you're, you're because there's a network. So if you actually record a cell, let's say, in, inside an, an oscillating system, and you actually record how much polarization you get, it's much more than you would expect in an isolated cell. So in the case of gamma, right, if we actually record from an intracellular cell during the field and see how much it depolarizes, these cells actually depolarize a lot more. Because you depolarize a whole bunch of them, and then something happens, and the network responds. Now you get a bigger polarization. Now you are holding that for 10, 20 minutes. Now these inputs come in. And maybe that's a substrate. But that, it, it, that is something that can be, be tested very explicitly in a slice. And we're working, on that. we're working on that now. The experiment that we have done is that if you do standard LTP, so you do like tetanization, and you produce potentiation, if you apply direct current during that time, you can produce more potentiation. So that, that's consistent with that idea. But clearly on its own, or with low intensity stimulation, nothing's going to happen. Maybe we haven't. We started with the with the with the the direction that yeah, that would be the idea. And, and other, and it's not just us. Other groups are showing this as well. So it's, it seems plausible. It still doesn't really address the question though. That's with the. It still doesn't address the question. Why does the field have to be on for ten minutes, for it to work in in people? Could you go to your slide for the four times one, the first one? This one? That one? Yes. And yes. um, uh, you can see there that there is an area of greater, OK, uh, like that the field is concentrated more. This is modeling, yeah? You, you this, is, this is purely modeling. It's a pure but prediction. In the model, you see that there is an area, a darker area, OK, that, like a more co the where the field concentrated Like here, you mean? Like yes. these clusters? Yeah. 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 Um, that suggests that for some reason, the, uh, the field will become more dense in some areas. You know, okay. Yes. OK. Uh, follow to that, OK. What will happen is you um, separate the electrode less. Would you go to almost a single point to concentrate it? So if you, if you start making the, the we start making the ring smaller and smaller, yes. and I think we've gone explicitly in modeling as far as something like two centimeters, but theoretically you can go more. You would predict that, that the current would be constrained to, to a more and more focal region. But the problem is now is that most of it starts, a lot of it is already flowing through the scalp as it is. As you start to make them closer and closer and closer, now 90%, 95% of the current is flowing through the scalp. And so the electric field, the maximum you see, starts to decrease. So now you say, well, now I have to turn up the current that I'm applying. And now you get into tolerability issues. And so there, there is a, there, right now there's a compromise between how focal you can be and how much, and how much current, yeah. Okay. But in any case, it's very focused, OK? It's incredible focus, and it's very interactive thing to do, because you can go to the sensory map now, OK? <coughs> in an awake, in an awake patient, and ask if he has sensitive in the, where you will be taking the map, the sensory map. Have you tried to do that? That's a good question. So we di that did not work. I'll tell you first what did. 
what we did is we tried to use, so you can, you can, instead of doing direct current, you can apply like a thousand volt pulses. It is extremely painful to do this, right? But we did these experiments. You can use this and instead of applying one, yeah, I was one of the subjects, it's horrible. It's actually, the tor it's like torture. It's like exactly how you imagine torture would be because you're also, you also have to relax. So you're being told to relax and again and again and then, you know, and you're messing and you're trying to randomize it because you're really, it's horrible. And then, you know, then they, yeah, it's hard. And then, and then they, it's like, oh, we forgot to turn on the, you know, this. <laughs> it was the worst, but we did it and it was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it because, you know, models, you know, you have to be, you don't want, you don't want to believe them, right? And so um, this is a thousand volts. Um, about a millisecond, and it's known that if you do this, now, now, the, now this is going to go up a thousand fold, right? So you're talking about, um, you're, you know, it's about 40 volt per meter, 100 volt per meter that you need to, to trigger um, an MEP. And so we put that 4X1 over the uh, motor region, and we were able to trigger MEPs. When we displaced it, one radius, so effectively now the motor was here, we were not able to trigger MEPs, and we we're also able to look at into so that was very reassuring. Um, we read a paper that you can transcranially stimulate uh, and affect sensation as well. Uh, but we're having a hard time with that because it's so painful. So you, you'd want to use very low intensity. So we, we tried to use like AC stimulation to try to stimulate some sort of tingling or something because people claim you can do that transcranially. We couldn't do that. We couldn't feel, we couldn't feel that's our fingers tingling. And then we increased the intensity more and then it got really painful at the scalp level. So it would be nice to do that, but we weren't able to get it to work. Did, did you report that you increased drastically after that experiment? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you get a lot of emails and stuff from, I definitely, I've gotten, in, so this has not made it and been into the popular press, right? It started, there's people, there's this, like this thing called do-it-yourself, TDCS. There's people making home units of this stuff. Because, you know, oh, well, DARPA funded it, so I should start using it on myself, right, at home. And it's very scary. So these people are doing it. Uh, and I, I do every now and then get contacted by one of these people. And one of them did once ask me, so I guess you're just doing this on yourself all the time, right? You must be, right? Because if it's working so well, then obviously all these researchers, and of course no one does. So that tells you maybe how, how, um, how much faith people have in it just yet. You're actually working on it. The trials that are the furthest along, uh, depression has been very far, so that's been, depression currently now is in a multi-center, it's a seven-center trial that's being run to FDA standards, and there was certainly phase two data prior to that suggesting that this was clinically meaningful. In the pain trial that we're running um, with, with Harvard for fibromyalgia, our primary uh, endpoint is a 50% reduction in pain after two weeks. So these are people who are chronically at nine. It's very ambitious. They're at nine, they're at eight, they're at nine and eight. And we're going to keep stimulating them until they get to a four or a five. And we've met that endpoint in half of the subjects so far that have been enrolled. Now this is open label, so there may be a placebo component to that as well. But these patients are difficult. So I would say depression and pain, um, but it's, it's almost scary. They're trying it for every, it's, you know, it's so easy to do. So if you're a lab that does ADHD, whatever, I'm just gonna get that, I'm gonna strap it on some, you know what I mean? It's so easy to do that it's promoting this explosion and people don't really know what they're doing and they don't really know how it works. So I struggled with that for a long time. The whole, everything I've told you here says that it has to be combined with something. So I'm like, what is it, what is it? The best I can come up with right now is it's paired with a placebo. It's paired with the fact that you are depressed, you are enrolled in an in a anti-depression trial, there's someone with a nice lab coat, they're coming in, they're strapping your head on, the machine is flashing, you're feeling a lot of tingling. It's a huge placebo effect. And we know, of course, placebo has a, a strong physiological basis, right? Like, you can, you can image, right, even changes associated with placebo. So the best I could come up with, and this is a venture, that it's, it's, you're pairing it with, with that, or something else that's going on as part, of, or as part of being part of the trial. But they're not pairing it with any, th there is TDCS plus cognitive therapy, but that's not this multi-center. This multi-center, you just sit there, you read a magazine. Maybe it's what you're reading, I don't know, but you know what I mean? Uh, but it, it's, it's, there's, there's a mismatch there. there. There certainly is a mismatch. Yeah. What's the regulatory status on devices that do this? Do, do IRBs require IDEs? How, how are these? Investigators doing their so it's considered non-significant risk. 
If you believe the clinical studies, it has zero side effects other than itching. Uh, but anyways, it certainly seems that it's, it's meeting the criteria of non-significant risks. That means when people want to run a trial, uh, they do not need an FDA IDE. As long as their local IRB considers a non-significant risk, it gets the, the expedited IDE status. And so the trials are being run under IDE, but this does not have to go to the FDA. And that's another reason why it's very e easy for people to adopt this technology. It's cheap. People tend to be, you know, people um, <coughs> consider it extremely safe. Really, people say, what, I mean, it, if it works so well, why are there no side effects? You think if something, you, you, it, it's, it's hard to imagine. Right? It's really hard to imagine. What's the, you know, kind of like, what, do they have to go through any kind of regulatory process or no? You just... Yeah, so for example, the, the company that, that I work with, so Terex and other companies, so even if you're IDE, even if you're non-significant risk, you're still governed by FDA regulations on IDE devices, and that include, for example, production under quality systems, um, IEC, electromagnetic. So these are not just current controlled, any you know, do-it-yourself kind of thing. Um, they are governed by that. But for custom devices, the FDA says all oh, bets are off. I, that's my understanding, right? So if you do a custom device, you can, it's custom. They're not going to they're not going to make you do all this paperwork. So if, I guess if you're making your own device in your own lab, which everyone here could do, it's a direct current source. You don't have to do that, I think. <laughs> so that's a big question. So a lot of these clinical trials now, especially when you're doing like a depression trial, you want to see something that ha like after you're done with a the therapy, you want to see it last, let's say, several weeks. And so the most I've seen people do is stimulate for maybe eight weeks and maybe track for two months. No one tracks beyond that. And you know, I think the reason is simply cost. These things are, you run something for six months, you run th no one wants to do it. They want to publish their paper, right? And so the trials tend to be very short, tends to be very limited, uh, but at least within that time frame, um, I've not heard nor have seen any publications of things, of things that people are concerned about. The primary um, adverse event that people talk about is itching during the stimulation that goes away and redness that also goes away and that could be due to the pressure. You may not believe that something that can do, that, 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 is, that is possible, right? That there are no cognitive side effects with this stuff uh, but that's, that's currently the, the framework of how people are approaching this. Well, thank you very much, Marlon. This okay. is a token of our appreciation. Okay, okay. Very exciting talk, and uh, hopefully, generate some collaborations. Thanks, thanks. thanks.